On today's show, we are glad to have retired detective Desmond Ryan, author of the Mike O'Shea crime series. He was a beat cop, a plainclothes detective, and now he's taken on all that experience and is writing crime fiction novels. Welcome to Murder in the Air, Des. Oh, thank you, Laurie. I'm so glad to be here. Well, now you're coming to us from Toronto today. Is that where your law enforcement career was as well? Yes, I was born and raised here. I'm a Toronto boy through and through. That is great. Now, on your website, you say that your career was exhilarating, exhausting, and often heartbreaking. Tell us just a little bit more. Give us a snapshot about your days on the force. Well, you know, um, I really think policing is the kind of job that if you don't like it, uh, it's just not going to work out for you. Um, every day is different, and there's a lot of, uh, even in Toronto, which is a, a, I mean, there's about 3 million people here now. And when I started, there was just over a million, which in the 80s seemed pretty big, and particularly in Canada. And um, it was busy, but there's a lot of times where you're doing reports and just sort of doing mundane things. And as has been said many times, it's sort of 98% boredom and 2% sheer and absolute terror. Um, and in retrospect, the terror times always seem really great, but at the time, not so much. Um, and basically what's happening, my experience was, it, it's like you're stepping into the middle of somebody's life. They have called for whatever reason, and it's it's live, it's raw, it's unrehearsed, and and it matters. And so, um, you know, like some of the situations are are truly heartbreaking for a variety of reasons. And I mean, it could be a, a domestic violence situation or a victimization sort of thing, uh, akin to domestic violence, or it could be a sudden death, or uh, you know, having to notify a family member that you know their child has has died. Um, and it's, it's just, it's very raw. And, uh, one of the things that I drew from that was it really brought me in touch with myself because I found, uh, I mean, the exhausting part was that I was drawing from myself as opposed to just having stock responses to things because there was no such thing as a stock radio call. You have to think on your feet every second, right? Yeah, and I mean, some of the calls were easier than others, and a lot of it was was fun and and interesting and all of that. But you know, again, when you're dealing with people's lives and they're looking to you to make things better, um, I mean, of course, the big realization is it. it I'm I'm not. I, I can't make it better. I I can help a little bit, but I can't fix it. And I, I think that's for a lot of authors, not or sort of police officers, not to get too heavy too soon. I think that's where a lot of the PTSD comes in, is realizing you can't make it better. Did you have any programs like I know they're doing today in our in our city uh, where the officers are getting some PTSD help and they're getting some training in some of those mental health issues where not only the, the people you deal with, but with your own uh, a, a, a on the force kind of work. Did you have any of that? Well, I started in uh, 1987 and back then PTSD was reserved for uh, you know army vets and then as the rest of the world started to to get attuned, the police uh, culture was pretty far behind in picking that up. And what I'm seeing now is they seem to be moving up a lot quicker because we are speaking about it within police agencies and officers are you know, committing suicide. And you know, back in the day, I don't think it's changed. I think just back in the day, nobody said anything. Um, I mean, the levels of uh, addiction to drugs, uh, alcohol, gambling, sex, whatever, you know, has always been there. But now uh, the supervisors are getting some training to look for signs of this. Um, and it's, it's not quite as stigmatized. I mean, 
Because back in the day, my, my thing was, if you, you know, if you didn't like the heat, get out of the kitchen. But there is a lot of heat, no matter <laughs> it, what you're dealing with, uh, whether it's paperwork and, and uh, you know, the upper uh, administration too, let alone um, in the field. Well, there's a, a high expectation of performance wherever you are within the organization. And so, uh, you know, that fallacy of like, once you're a senior officer, you just sit in your office, you don't do anything. The matrix that they have to work within and the things that they have to ensure that their uh, officers achieve is, in my opinion, pretty unrealistic. I mean, how do you how do you control what everybody can do? But that's what they have to do and they have to deal with budgets. It's just a different kind of stress. While obviously all police officers have some grim days, um, the story you're going to read for us in a little bit is about an older Irish volunteer for the local parish and includes a bit of her local dialect and, and a wee bit of humor. And with your series name, Mike O'Shea, and your last name is Ryan, I'm guessing you might have a bit of the, a wee bit of Irish in you. Uh, yeah, just, just a little bit. Um, and in Toronto, uh, I mean, as in New York and Chicago, it's like the, the Irish were sort of hired on as police officers. Um, you know, part of it was just that farm boy sort of physique, which I don't have. Um, but, um, yeah. And, and when I wrote the Mike O'Shea, uh, series, um, it's a police procedural, where I was able to draw very much on my own experiences. And as I like to say, everything in the Mike O'Shea books is true. It just didn't happen like that. Okay. <laughs> so um, I put in uh, a character, Mike O'Shea's mother, Mary Margaret, who's you know, a first-generation Canadian, and so she still has very much her, her dialect. And like many people who come, uh, particularly to Canada, um, they tend to become more of their home country than they were when they were in the home country. And so she's really hung on to the corn beef and cabbage thing and, um, you know, very involved in the Irish culture. And I introduced her into the Mike books as just a little bit of, of lightness, just to, to give some levity because the Mike books got pretty dark and they do get dark because he's involved in a lot of very, difficult situations. The second in the series, Death Before Coffee, is where Mar Mary Margaret kind of comes into her own. And then in the next book, which will be coming out probably in January of 2024, uh, Man at the Door, she pretty much takes over the book. And I really had to struggle with that character as a writer to keep her in her place. And what came out of that was that she just needed her own book because she was too strong a character. And so that's how uh, the Mary Margaret series, which is actually called Pint of Trouble series, has come into being. And that is coming out now. And the first book is called um, Mary Margaret and the Case of the Lapsed Parishioner. And we're going to hear from that in just a minute. But first of all, let's, let's, so thanks for clarifying that and, and talking a little bit about Mike O'Shea. And, and I, I, I'm sure obviously those stories come from your background. Uh, let's do just a few writing kind of, uh, questions, if I may. Uh, talk about your writing process and, uh, like what the best time for you is to write. Well, you know, Laurie, one of the great things about police work where you work shifts and around the clock and when you're tired and when it's raining and when it's beautiful and all that stuff. Um, and you write a lot of reports. And so what I learned from that is that when it's time to write, you write. Like I, I didn't have an opportunity as a police officer, you know, and someone's supposed to be appear in court in two hours to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do the paperwork. I've got a writer's block. You can't do that. Uh, it doesn't mean it's your best work, but it gets done. And so now I find that I can write pretty much any time. And depending on what I'm writing depends on when I choose to write. And I'm fortunate that I have that space to do so. Um, in, in some of the, um, of course, it's, it's easier to write, I think, in the morning because then it's out of the way and you've got your day to, to, to deal with. However, 
there's uh, if I'm doing something that's sort of a, a gentler scene, a little more fun, I might choose to do it at night just because it's fun and entertaining for me anyway. Um, and I have the space to do that. Interesting uh, I, that depending on what you write then also kind of dictates when you write. Yes. And if I have a difficult scene to write, um, when I'm, for example, when I'm doing, uh, the, some of the things in the Mike O'Shea book, I will do them when I get up in the morning, you know, sit down and get it not out of the way isn't quite, but get it down on paper because then it's out of my mind and it's not sort of vexing me throughout the day. So what is, uh, maybe the most surprising thing that you've discovered about writing fiction, I should say, not reports. Well, I, I discovered how the characters really do take on a life of their own. And I'm, I'm sure you know, you and many of the other writers that you you've spoken with have had the same experience where we like to think that, you know, we're omniscient and we're controlling everything. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, a bit of a, a, a pantsy plotter, which is to say I, I, I plot, but I allow for things to go a little bit off and then I bring them back. And I'm always surprised at how the characters will just run with it. And a few chapters later, I have to really rein them in to get back to where we need to be. They don't listen to you sometimes either, do they? No. And when you speak about it, it, it sounds... A, a little bit unhinged, but I'll also realize that I, I can be sitting and uh, it seems like it's been an extraordinarily busy day in, in my world and that I haven't actually gotten up except to go to the bathroom. Uh, you know, and, and according to my little you know, walking thing on my phone, I'm dead, uh, <laughs> but it, it's been so busy in my head and I'm exhausted. Sometimes you can control them and they argue with you. And it is like, this is in my head. This is like a little spooky here, right? Yeah. And a lot of times I feel like I'm just trying to, uh, it reminds me of taking statements from people where you just try to write down what they say as fast as you can and hope you catch it all. You've got the, the Mike O'Shea and now his mother has his, her own series. Uh, what are you working on next? Well, I decided I would do, uh, still within the, the framework of... Um, of crime, crime fiction. Um, I've started a series, um, that it's, it's set in, in Ireland. Um, and it's in a, a small village just north of Dublin. And the main character, and I'm, I'm hoping it'll sort itself out. Um, he's a retired police officer, but he spent his whole policing career doing desk duty. And he very ill suited to policing. He just sort of ended up and they kept him on just because he could answer the phones and was polite. <laughs> Retires, moves to the small village. They have a murder and everyone in the village builds this narrative around what this guy must be. And he's a real introvert. And so they're assuming that he's an introvert because he's seen too much. You know, he keeps to himself because he's uh -huh. seen too much. Um, they've decided that he's actually worked in the murder squad for the Garda. And in fact, he has not. And so there's this whole sort of comedy of, of assumptions and errors that he ends up being able to solve the murder, but really it wasn't him. It was just everybody else deciding what must happen and how it should proceed. Good. And, and do you have a series title yet? Well, at this point, the guy's name is Hearty Albright. Um, and it's Hearty with a D, but then um, as, you know, having gone through the school system, they ended up calling him Hardly Albright oh. be because they, he's an introvert and they assume that because he's an introvert that he's not too clever and all that. And, and uh, he moves, again, he moves to this village where nobody knows him and he's, he becomes Hart Albright, but I, I thought I'd call it the, right now, just call it the, uh, the Hearty Albright series. If you would give us a little setup for the story you're going to read and then read from Mary Margaret and the case of the lapsed parishioner. Oh, fantastic. So Mary Margaret um, used to be the secretary at St. Francis of Assisi Church, and she's just retired. 
And she has moved in with her son, Mike O'Shea, who's sustained a significant injury at work. His wife has left him. They have a, a, he has a 17 year old son. And she decides that she must move in with her son, Michael, uh, to look after him and to, to keep things going. Now he is recovering from his injuries. He's back at work. His life is carrying on as it should. And, um, she is very afraid that he, she's going to have to return back to her house at the other side of, of, of the city. And as we will find out, she comes up with reasons throughout the series for her having to stay at his house. And in this particular case, she's been called back to the church because the new girl, Ashley, uh, is off on her honeymoon. At the time, they have to set up this church bazaar that funds a lot of the programs that the church operates. So they need Mary Margaret back. However, Father McGill, who is the new priest, uh, he's a young fellow, and Mary Margaret is quite sure that he is gunning to become Pope, has called her back and immediately realizes he wishes he didn't. And Mary Margaret immediately realizes she wishes she never came back. In this particular um, book, she's she's there, and they are preparing for this um, church bazaar, and she's called upon a parishioner to come and help her sort, and the parishioner does not show up. And I... I don't think I'm giving away too much by saying that the parishioner is the lapsed parishioner is the victim of this murder. And, and of course, with all of the, um, uh, facilities and, and, and things available to the police service, it is Mary Margaret, of course, who is able to solve this mystery. Mary Margaret O'Shea looked at her watch for the fifth time in 12 minutes, then shook it vigorously just in case it wasn't working properly. It was, and still no sign of Jane Ann Hill, one of the parishioners, albeit somewhat lapsed, at St. Francis of Assisi who had volunteered to help this morning. Not the day for a lie-in, my girl, Mary Margaret thought. We've more clothing than a doxy's got dates that need sorting, and I kinda do it myself. She pulled out her cell phone and called the number she had for Jane Ann and left yet another message. It joined the nine she had already left. Ugh, what if something has come of the lamb, and here I am worrying about a wee bit of sortin'. Best to get on with it and hope she shows up. Although she had retired as church secretary a few months ago, Mary Margaret found herself back now at St. Francis of Assisi to manage the fall bazaar. It should have been the responsibility of Ashley, the new girl. The new girl, however, was floating around in the Caribbean at the moment on her honeymoon. Had the proceeds of this event not funded the daily breakfast programs for three daycares within the parish, the planning of the bazaar would not have been such importance, and the new girl's absence would have been a non-issue. As things stood, however, Father McGill had no choice but to ask Mary Margaret to come back for a couple of weeks to ensure that the bazaar took place and was the success it had been in previous years. Being the good soldier, Mary Margaret had agreed to return, only to regret her decision almost the moment she set foot back in her former office. Amongst other things, she discovered that her successor had failed to organize the volunteers to help prepare for the big day, nor had any local businesses been contacted to donate raffle prizes. Simply put, things were a mess. Having raised four children mostly on her own, however, she developed an act for sorting out messes. As such, Mary Margaret called in a few favors, and the regulars sent in their donations for the raffle. The hardest part of her job was to get at least one person a day to come in to help sort the bags of used clothing the parishioners had dropped off over the past few weeks. But she did it. Today was Jane Ann Hill's day, and she was not here. After a morning spent checking her watch, calling Jane Ann several more times, and then sorting through bags of sweaters, pants, and mismatched socks on her own, Mary Margaret was ready for a break. Nothing to do but to put on a kettle, she thought, making her way from the cluttered parlor towards what used to be her office. Everything all right, Father McGill said as he walked past her in the hallway. Everything's fine, Father. Mary Margaret replied, not missing a step and knowing full well that he must have passed by the room several times during the morning and seen her sorting the clothing alone. If only Father Brian were still here, he'd be in there like a dirty shirt helping. 
Considering I'm doing on me own with a room full of things needing to be sorted by Friday, she added. Remembering how disproportionately dependent the smooth running of his day had rested on the ups and downs of Mary Margaret's own day, Father McGill knew that it was in his best interest to try to help her deal with her problem. Where are your volunteers? he asked, following her to the front desk. Volunteer, Mary Margaret corrected, plugging in the kettle she had brought from her son's house, where she had been staying the last couple of weeks. Where's the Keurig? It makes tea as well, you know. Father McGill looked around for the new coffee maker Ashley had set up. Away! You can't make a good cup in under five minutes. Regardless, Mary Margaret continued, reaching into the desk drawer to pull out a Barry's tea bag she had also brought from Michael's house. The new girl seems to have neglected to sign up any volunteers, so I've been left to my own devices to rally the troops. Luckily, Jane Ann Hill, who was a part of the congregation many years ago, agreed to help. Said she was available for this morning, she did, and now she's not shown up. Did you call her? Many times. You may think I do nothing but sit on me backside and sip tea all day, Father, but even now, coming in from me retirement, at your request, as you may recall, I am the one who runs this church day to day. Father McGill bit his lip, annoyed at himself for having called in the woman who had been left as a legacy from previous priests after finally having gotten rid of her. Still biting your lip, Father. Clearly nerves. You know, Father Brian had such horrible stage fright before every Mass. It's not nerves that caused me to bite my lip, Mary Margaret. Now, what happened when you called your volunteer? No answer. On any of the calls I made to her. Now, if you don't mind, I've got a kettle waiting for me. Unless you'd like to join me for a cuppa? Perhaps another time. I've got some paperwork to do. Father McGill was turning to leave when he noticed a pair of crutches leaning against the wall in the corner. What are those for? Well, Father, Mary Margaret sighed. It's a long story. Oh, God. But I'll cut to the chase. As you will recall, just after I retired, me Michael, the big city police detective, got beaten to near death while arresting the murderer. Was in all the papers. I, of course, immediately packed up me things and went to look after him. Time passes and he's thinking he's better, but I can see that he's still a pint below the court. That's both the gift and the curse of motherhood. Father, knowing what your children need. Anyway, I was just out with Sally next door's dog, thinking about how to bring me Michael round to the notion that I ought to stay on, when the wee pup knocks into me. Of course, I'm fine, but some idiot at the dog park called an ambulance. I see. Father McGill said, holding his hand to his mouth to stop biting his lip. Because of me age, the paramedics thought I ought to go to the hospital. Of course, me foot was fine, but this is where it came to me, Father. If me foot was broken, there would be no way me Michael would send me home. So you lied and told your son your foot was broken? Well, yes, but the ends justify the means. So, well, I did lie. When all is said and done, no one will mind. Board a pair of crutches that I saw by the nurse's station on my way out, and have been hobbling around on them, more or less, ever since. So you lied and stole. Fibbed and will return the crutches in another few weeks. Yes. Do you not think anyone has noticed that you don't have a cast on your foot? Well, here's the thing of it, Father. I said I was part of a test group. A test group? That's me story, yes, and this is how it goes. The hospital is working on this castless method, wherein they... Not wanting to hear the rest, Father McGill walked out of the office, shaking his head, as he made his way down the hall towards his own office, silently cursing himself for even remotely having imagined that bringing Mary Margaret back, even for a couple of weeks, was a good idea. Mary Margaret, meanwhile, turned her attention to the boiling kettle, thankful that she didn't have to explain herself to this young priest any further. She heard a slight cough a few feet away. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, could you not have knocked me, girl? She yelped, almost scalding herself with the boiling water she was pouring, in the absence of a teapot, into her mug. Sorry, are you Mary Margaret? The woman asked. I am. And are you doing the sorting for the bazaar on Saturday? Apparently I am, yes. I'm Crystal Hill. I was just down the hall looking for my mother, Jane Ann Hill. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. And I've been looking for your ma'am all morning myself. I was supposed to pick her up here and take her for lunch. Well, she's not here and I'm just making myself a cuppa. Hopefully she's just running late. Would you care for one whilst you wait? Mary Margaret looked around for a second mug. Finding none, she decided again. 
the new girl clearly has a lot to learn about being a church secretary. She's not here? No. And here I've been on my own sorting away for the past two hours. That's unlike her. From what I know of her, she's punctual to a fault. Well, I can't vouch for that, but I'm assuming that when your ma'am says she's going to be somewhere, there she be. Do you think something has happened to her? Oh, I don't know, love. I gave her at least a dozen, dozen rings. I'd have to say, the first six or so were between 9 and 9.30, and then it just became more of a habit, and I carried on until about 10.30, and there was never an answer. Have you given her a ring? No, I assume she'd be here. I'll give her a call now. I cannot possibly have a cup on me own, but I'll drop without one. No answer, Crystal said. Well, maybe she's stuck in transit. You know, this city isn't getting any easier to run around in. She lives in the co-op around the corner. She would have walked here. Since when? I thought she'd moved into one of those luxury condos downtown, which is why she stopped coming to church. That and Father Brian leaving, of course, Mary Margaret said, pulling the tea bag from the mug. She did move, and now she's back. It's a long story. Well, I'm sure we've all got a long story or two hidden in our pantries. You're right about that, Crystal said with a sad smile. But I am wondering where she is now. My son is a police detective. Do you want me to give him a ring, then? No, I I'm sure it's not serious. It was obvious to Mary Margaret that Crystal was trying to convince herself more than anyone else. Suit yourself, love, but my son tells me about his investigations all the time. Says most people report their loved ones missing far too late for the police to do anything. Says someone is missing as soon as they're out of their routine and not where they're supposed to be. Might that sound like your mom now? She passed the mug of tea to Crystal, deciding that the younger woman needed it far more than she did. Ah, oh, look at you. Your hands are shaking like the legs of a newborn lamb. Why don't you call the police? Maybe she's been in an accident. Crystal's knees buckled under her. Mary Margaret grabbed the mug and helped the younger woman to a chair before she could fall to the ground. I'm not saying she has, love, but it would rule things out if you called, don't you think? Here, use the phone on me desk in front of you. I'll just step out for a moment to give you some privacy. With that, Mary Margaret walked down the hall to Father McGill's office. So I see your volunteer has arrived, he said with some satisfaction. No, that would be her daughter, Jane Ann's missing. Missing? Always one for the dramatics, aren't we? Drama or no, the woman's not here, she's not answering her phone, and her daughter has no idea where she is, so I'd say she's missing. I'm sure she'll turn up. That said, Father McGill looked back at his computer screen. Father, Mary Margaret said, sitting down in the chair on the other side of his desk. Do you think you could perhaps tear yourself away from your work here and offer a word of comfort to the girl? Comfort? Yes, you know, reassurance, support, hope. I know what comfort means, Mary Margaret, the young priest said, straightening up in his chair. Sometimes I wonder, Mary Margaret muttered under her breath. I understand that there's a room full of clothing that has to be sorted and priced by... When was it? Friday? I hear God's work summonsing me, Father, Mary Margaret said tartly as she got up and left the room. At least you take direction from someone, the priest mumbled. I heard that. Well, me love, Mary Margaret said, re-entering her old office just as Crystal was hanging up the phone. They say she hasn't been taken to any of the hospitals. That's a good sign. But I don't think it's like her to not answer her phone, especially if she's late. That's not a good sign. So I reported her missing. I'm sure she'll turn up safe and sound sooner than later. In the meantime, if I may ask, would you mind helping me get ready for the bazaar? I could use another set of hands and it might take your mind off of this until she turns up. Chapter 2 Detective O'Shea, how may I help you? A gruff voice said. Michael, this is your mother calling. Mom? His voice softened. The very same. Listen to me, son. I need your help. Mary Margaret said, holding the phone close to her face. Are you okay? Of course I'm okay. It's not me I'm calling about. It's about one of our parishioners. Lapsed parishioners, if the truth need be telling. She's missing. Hold on a minute. Don't worry, lad. She's already been reported. I'm just wondering what's being done about it so far. When was she reported missing? About an hour ago. Then I'd say nothing has been done, Michael said with a sigh. Nothing, Mary Margaret said, pulling the phone away from her ear to give it a closer look before putting it back. Nothing. And we pay your salaries then, do we? 
Don't start, Mom. A woman has been reported missing, and you've done not a thing about it. She could be this minute being beaten by some sadist or sexually molested by... Doubtful. What is her name? Jane Ann Hill. Have you got her on your computer, then? Just give me a minute. There was a pause. Yes. Okay. Says she was reported missing by her daughter about an hour ago. Yes, I know that, Mary Margaret exclaimed. That's what I was just telling you. No addiction, no mental health issues, no... Wait a minute. Why am I telling you this? Because I'm your mother. Now, where are your lads looking for her? They're not. What? That makes no sense to me at all, me son. She's not considered a high risk for... For what? Murder? Well then, what if the poor woman had got amnesia and is wandering about in the woods somewhere? What woods, Mom? We live in the city. Michael said patiently. I don't know, me son. Some woods. There are parklands and ravines and the like, you know. Or worse yet, maybe she's fallen into the lake and is this very moment flailing madly. Unlikely. Ugh, I don't know why I even called. I love you too, Mom. There has not been a moment since before you were born that I have not loved you, Michael. But there have been many moments since that that have tried my patience. So, what you're telling me is that there's nothing you can do. Not right now, Mom, no. Well, I'll not keep you from your real police work then. Tara. Dare I ask, Father McGill said, poking his head in Mary Margaret's office. One of your flock is missing, Father, and the police are doing not a thing about it. I take it that this is about the woman from this morning? The very same, Father. No signs of foul play? I have no idea, Father. I've just this moment gotten off the phone with me, Michael, who is as useless as a pair of ice skates at a swimming pool. I see. Well, I'm sure that if there is anything... No disrespect intended, Father, and I hate to cut you short, but once I've had me tea... I'll be busier than a one-armed paper hanger getting ready for the bazaar. So unless you've any words to offer, no, I'm done. Enjoy your tea, Mary Margaret. Mary Margaret got on the bus to make her way home, but unlike this morning, it was well past rush hour and the bus was practically empty. She carefully settled herself down in her preferred seat at the front of the bus, adjacent to the driver. She missed the days before the plexiglass dividers separated the drivers from everyone else, when she would talk to the driver about everything from the weather to world politics. These days, she usually brought something to read to pass the time instead. Upon opening her book, Mary Margaret found her mind wandering to the events of the day, and for no particular reason, except that he was the only other occupant, her eyes settled on the young man at the back of the bus. Seeing that the young man was looking back at her, Mary Margaret looked down at her book and pretended to read for the remainder of her ride, but not before noticing that he had a cloth sack that looked like a pillowcase bulging on either sides, full of items that were unlikely pillows. Oh, that was such fun, Des. Thank you so much. That was Desmond Ryan reading from Mary Margaret and the Case of the Laps Parishioner. You can find out more about Desmond Ryan on his website at realdesmondryan.com. You can follow Desmond on Facebook and Instagram at as Desmond P, initial P, Ryan. And he's on Twitter at Real Desmond Ryan. All those details will be in the show notes as well. Thanks again for being with us today, Des. Oh, you're more than welcome. It was great. Thank you very much for having me. You're very welcome. In our author extra, writer Darlene DeZamba has a dog for her muse as author of the Lily Dreyfus mystery series. And she says she incorporates sardonic wit and lively dialogue into her writing about her furry friends. Her first novel, Clues from the Canines, launched in 2022 and was nominated for the Silver Falchion Award. And in 2023, she published Up Close and Possonal. That's P-A-W-S-O-N-A-L. She's a member of the Sisters in Crime Grand Canyon chapter, has a 35-year career in finance at the University of Pennsylvania, and when she's not volunteering for the Animal Welfare Association in New Jersey, you can find her online at readdarlene.com. Join us next time on episode number 22, where you'll hear more radio-style theater from the audiobook for Bleeder called Art of the Steel. 
And on episode number 23, Barbara Hinsky will be here to talk about her cozy mysteries, how two books of hers got made into Hallmark movies, and she'll read from her Who's There collection of mystery and suspense standalones called Final Circuit. If you're listening on the podcast platform of your choice, please subscribe and leave a review or provide us with feedback. If you're on YouTube at Read Lori Fagan, please subscribe, give us a thumbs up, and click on the bell to be notified when a new episode has been released. And for some freebies, check out our Patreon page at Murder in the Air Mystery Theater. For more information, you can visit ReadLaurieFagan.com. Thanks so much for listening, and come back again where you'll always find murder in the air. Murder in the air.